Right, now this is the Mark IX. In fact, it's not a tank. It looks like one, possibly, but it isn't really. It's a supply carrier and a personnel carrier, which is why it's got those large doors on the side and no sponsons or weapon mountings on the side at all. It's totally different. Now, the Mark IX was again built at the very end of the war, too late to see service. So it, they built a few and they were used briefly around Bovington. After that, they fade away completely. But it's again, it's an interesting vehicle. Um, inside, it's got an amazing layout. The engines at the front moved as far forward as you can get it. And because of its cramped position, they have a very unusual method of starting it. The actual crank handle works at 90 degrees to the main engine. It's quite incredible how they managed to get it in. But the thing had an electric starter as well, so you only needed the crank handle if the electric starter failed. Otherwise, it's, it's quite a roomy inside. It, Oh, what they did actually inside was make it as roomy as possible. It would take up to 10 tonnes of stores or it would take 30 infantrymen. Now, the only drawback from the infantrymen's point of view was that they weren't allowed to sit, they couldn't sit down anywhere, there was nowhere to sit. So a few of them could actually stand and fire rifles through holes in the side. Everybody else had to mingle and stand around, but they had to watch it because although they got most of the main control rods running along the roof to try and get them clear of the floor. They couldn't do anything about the prop shaft. And the engine being right at the front, the prop shaft runs all the way back through the middle of the um, passenger compartment to the gearbox at the rear. And it meant that they had to be careful not to catch their feet on it because it wouldn't do you any good to get the crankshaft whizzing around by your boots or catching your foot. It's painted with the letters IC, which mean infantry carrier. Well, this is the only one left anywhere. There were no Mark 9s anywhere else, but they only built about a couple of dozen of them anyway. It's quite a unique vehicle, but not a very pretty one, unfortunately. Um, the track's standard type going around, but the formation of the hull's slightly different. Um, it was called the Pig, and you never really know whether that's anything to do with what it looked like or how difficult it was to drive, but that was what it was known as. It's got a commander's post up at the top above the cab, and the driver actually sits slightly to the left and looks out through a, a typical vision slot at the front. And that's, you only really had three crew, a commander, a driver, and a machine gunner who lived at the back and could fire his machine gun out of the back if he wanted to, or if there was anything to shoot at. But um, otherwise it's normally armored, just, to, just enough to keep small arms fire out. It won't actually stop a shell, but it will keep the, um, the small arms fire out and means that you can, get, you can get men forward fairly safely. Now, to be honest with you, I've always thought as a supply tank, it's a bit of a waste of time because it takes about 10 tonnes of stores and that can be enough for five ordinary service tanks. And it would take quite a time to go around the battlefield looking for service tanks to fill up. It was probably better to use ordinary supply tanks, which were quite common and could do the same job, but without quite so much of a load in them. And this thing seems to me to put in too many eggs in one basket. One way of looking at it, really. But, uh, also, you know, the idea was there. But uh, Winston Churchill, when he was Minister of Munitions, actually said that he thought supply tanks are more important than fighting tanks, which is about the silliest thing I've ever heard said. Still, if Winston Churchill said it, it must have been right. But uh, that one of these tanks was actually used on um, Armistice Day in 1918, 11th of November, and it was used on Hendon Reservoir as an amphibian. It didn't do very well. They put huge things called camels on the side, to allow it to float. They fitted paddles to the tracks and they fitted a sort of superstructure around the cab. And it went out on Hendon Reservoir, paddled a short way and broke down. And of course, when it broke down, it meant that the um, bilge pump broke down as well. It started to fill with water. So the crew were waving their arms about, hoping to be towed back to shore before it sank. But uh, that's the only sort of conversion of the tank that I've ever come across. And that was carried out on the prototype. So here it is, the, their unusual vehicles in that they were actually built by uh, one of the firms that wasn't a normal builder of, um, 
the fighting tanks. The first, the prototypes are built by Armstrong Whitworth up in Newcastle. And then they started producing them by a firm in Gainsborough in Lincolnshire and Marshalls, I think they were. In fact, this one's got a plate in the back. It's hard to see, but there's an actual plate of the manufacturers in the back of the tank. So it, they're quite unusual in that they came from a, a firm that wasn't renowned for tank building at that time. Quite an interesting sort of commentary on what was happening in this country as we tried to get more firms involved in tank construction. It's not perhaps the most interesting tank you'll see, but the idea of it coming so early on in tank development it's quite interesting that they actually thought they needed an APC. One of them was actually fitted out as a traveling um, hospital. It had a, a surgical team in the back and the idea was that you could carry out emergency operations on people in the field. But again, these are only ideas that they tossed around and tried to make something of and didn't get very far with. But still, it's one of the earliest of the supply tanks on a very interesting vehicle in its own right.